Okay, we are talking about cultivating gratitude and subsequently abundance. I think a lot of people understand that the vibration of gratitude is powerful. I think maybe some understand that it's directly tied to our abundance. But a lot of people don't have what I call the vibrational ingredients for gratitude, and they don't understand how to cultivate them. And for people who have experienced ongoing heartache or a lot of heartache, which is, to be honest, most of us, it can be even harder. Um, I identified with that myself. I knew I needed to find gratitude, but I felt like I was working so hard to get it and it was counterproductive and I began to feel like kind of a failure because I couldn't you know get the gratitude that I was supposed to have and everybody was telling me it was really easy so um, that's kind of what this video is about it's finding you know it's talking about the vibrational ingredients for gratitude helping you know to understand how to cult how to cultivate them and then I'm going to give you two easy practices that you can use to do that that anybody can use no matter you know who you are what you've been through um, you can start using them now and you can use them over and over in kind of this progressive way to begin to build up this kind of um, vibrational like muscle this m gratitude muscle so I'm starting out just by showing you like what your these two energy centers would look like if we were able to have gratitude and have a good relationship with gratitude. A lot of the, you know, this is really based in the heart chakra. It would be nice, open, clear. We'd have these, you know, green energy plus this pink energy, which I can't show you, but, um, and this is this two kind of vibrations and they're really moving, you know, freely interacting with, with each other and being engaged as needed. This heart chakra would be open and it would be very, very clear for these vibrations to be moving around. And then um, this kind of solar plexus chakra down here would be nice and balanced. Primarily, you know, gratitude is found in the heart. But when we have an overactive solar plexus chakra, um, it tends to cause problems also in the heart chakra. And so we want also a nice balanced solar plexus to support that heart chakra balance, especially in kind of what I call the doing and being vibrations, which people respectively might call the yang and the yin or the masculine and the feminine. So where a lot of us are at, just kind of like on the whole, I would say, let me hide this one and show you kind of where a lot of us are at now. And that's this very overactive solar plexus chakra which is inflamed, it's overheated, it's giving way too much doing. Um, and then we have this heart chakra that's not open and free and clear. It's kind of closed and precluded. It's got this older energy and we might have just this tiny bit of this other kind of vibration that attaches us to our spiritual home and gives us this higher perspective. So we want to, you know, fix all of that. And we can do all of that, obviously, through our vibration. But um, by, you know, doing work like, you know, eating the right foods and moving our body the right way and mudras and, you know, crystals and herbs and all that stuff. But I'm going to be talking about, you, you always know those things. I'm going to be talking about kind of two other ways. So um, first, abundance, your ability to be abundant or find abundance is directly correlated to your ability to be grateful. So it's very difficult to have abundance, not impossible, but to have abundance of all kinds, including material abundance, when we can't be grateful. And then there's all these ingredients to gratitude. And I would say the most important of all these ingredients to gratitude that work in these kind of cyclical in this like kind of cyclical way is healthy connection, having a good relationship with that vibration. And this, that healthy connection really is what unconditional love is. This is being able to say, I'm connected to you, but not with attachment, not with expectations, um, and so it sort of give you know, that can kind of make or break more than the others and kind of drive. But these, you know, again, unconditional love, which is redundant to me because if it's not unconditional, in my opinion, it's not love. Vulnerability, empathy, 
grace, having trust for people. These are all kind of cause and cyclically correlated, and they're all bound together, okay? Um, and to get this more important ingredient connection, it kind of can help to almost like reverse engineer. So we want to be able to be vulnerable. That's kind of the key. Um, and then when we can be vulnerable, we, or when we have the right kind of boundaries, it's easier to be vulnerable and it's easier to trust and all these things, you know, you could start with one and end up at another in this endless kind of way. And so that's why I say that, you know, it can be cultivated because you can get into this cycle. You can kind of start anywhere you want in this cycle. And then the other great thing is that um, when we start, you know, this kind of abundance wheel, I guess I'll call it gratitude and abundance wheel, um, you know, it also starts to promote these healthy things in the solar plexus chakra. So this balanced solar plexus chakra is giving, you know, all these benefits belief in yourself, this kind of quiet confidence where you don't have to say all the great things you've done. You know, sometimes people say to me like, oh, when they find out, like, I can't believe you've done this, this, and this. And I'm like, yeah, because I don't, like, I don't know. I don't need to tell anyone anymore. And at one point in my life, I would lead with, you know, all of my accomplishments. So you don't have these power struggles, right? You, your ego is very balanced, which is huge. You're working smarter, not harder. You're having less of this overthinking. You're having definitely less to, you know, no anxiety when we have a solar plexus chakra that looks like this. So these two things kind of also work in tandem. When you start working on the gratitude and vulnerability, it can start balancing down here and when you can start balancing down here it can kind of start doing that since this is all cyclical um you know let's get practical right and um that's where i was going with this like it's easy to get overwhelmed when you look at this and you're like well you could start here you could start there and you could go you know 12 places next and so what i did was kind of tune into the collective vibration the cosmic vibration and said like where can we start and what came up for me was that, you know, to start with working on boundaries and vulnerability and to develop these practices that would help. Boundaries and vulnerability, interestingly, when I um, sort of tuned into them after I got this, like, okay, do boundaries and vulnerability. When I tuned into them, it was like, oh, this is very much... Um, they're very much mirror images of each other, boundaries and vul vulnerability. They're kind of like, you know, the yin and the yang, so to speak. So we're setting boundaries, we're doing something, and we're being, being vulnerable, right? We're sort of, that's the being, that's more of the yin. Um, so this is a, a really beautiful way to balance that energy in the heart chakra, which um, just gives you such, you know, deeper connections and, and, um, and just really more peace within yourself, but it also balances out in that solar plexus chakra. So there's a lot of great things. And right now we're still riding some of this full moon energy. And today, in fact, um, which is the 28th, we're, um, whoops, sorry, we're having this, um, you know, the moon is in this phase where it's kind of half, half and half, you know, half, half light and half dark. So this is really a perfect day to start working on this stuff too. So uh, before we move into the practices, I want to just encourage you to be gentle with yourself because cultivating gratitude and being vulnerable do not happen overnight, especially as I mentioned, many of our hearts have been closed for a long time in protection because the world can be cold and hard for a lot of people. And so just acknowledging the fact that it's not as easy as people say necessarily for a lot of people um, and that the acknowledgement that we have really been habituated away from being vulnerable, open, empathetic, trusting. Um, we don't, you know, have the ability to set the right kind of boundaries for ourselves, and we'll talk about what the right kind of boundaries are. But, you know, it's like we sort of set boundaries with certain things, but with other things like work, for instance, you know, we're really celebrated for not setting any boundaries and like being at work 24-7. So again, just that understanding that 
This is something that we're not habituated to do. And in fact, we're habituated against it. Um, it can help just that, that wheel that I mentioned, that kind of wheel of abundance and gratitude kind of start spinning, okay? So because, again, they're all cyclical. Um, so um, with vulnerability and boundaries, I kind of mentioned, you know, where, where I sort of got that, right? Um, but we also just practically have kind of a level of control, um, over these practices. And that's another reason why it's really good to kind of start there. So let's, um, look, talk a little bit more about what boundaries and vulnerability are and maybe are not. Um, very simply, boundaries are supposed to make you happy, right? The point of boundaries. And this doesn't mean make you happy at the expense of everyone else. And, you know, you take on all these like psychopathic narcissistic tendencies. But the idea of boundaries is to make you happy and to live a good life. So they are things that you do and things that you ask others to do to make you happy, to maintain your peace. And then based on, you know, whether or not others do these things, you, you know, might keep them in your life or etc. Okay. So there are kind of like three parts in setting boundaries. And because there are these three parts, they're dynamic, meaning boundaries are meant to change. They're meant to be, you know, experimental. And especially when you're building this muscle of building a boundary, experimentation is necessary. Um, I, you know, just for instance, have been going back with some certain members of my family where I'm like, you know, I'm trying like, okay, I'm going to open this a little bit more. And if it doesn't go well, oh, I'm going to, you know, set a stronger boundary. And so, um, you know, again, understanding that it's a process almost moves you right into a place of more grace and, and gentleness with yourself. So um, these three parts are setting the boundary, enforcing the boundary, and evaluating. And a lot of times, well, first of all, we usually know, right, what boundaries we want to do. And we might go, oh, I'm going to do this, like this this person or that person or whatever, like they're going to get it. I'm going to be doing this and this. And, you know, I, they'll never treat me like this again. Right. And then something happens <laughs> when it comes time to enforce the boundary. And that's okay. Because again, this isn't happening for most people and that the ability to enforce is found in here and we don't have that. And then there's also this sense of like evaluating. So like I was just mentioning with my family, like, did it work? oh, that boundary was too strong or that boundary was not strong enough. And so you kind of go back. And so something that helps, at least has helped me, is to think about boundaries um, in, in terms of plots of land, okay? So boundaries are in a relationship. If you use this kind of analogy of, of a plot of land, what boundaries do is they designate, you know, where your land starts and where someone else's land begins or, you know, vice versa. So if your heart or the love, you know, that you give is your land, when we don't have boundaries, people can come in and do whatever they want on our land, okay? <laughs> um, and it's also hard to know where we begin and where someone else ends. And so this leads into that process of like our giving and receiving isn't measured because we don't even understand like, am I giving to me or am I giving to them? These lines are blurred. Now, if you think of boundaries like a fence or a wall, okay, so let's say fence or a wall on that land, boundaries actually keep people out and they keep what you have inside. Okay, I don't know, maybe you have like chickens running around and you don't want them to, you know, leave your property. So depending on where you live, you are probably going to have a fence, right? If we're using this land analogy and that's all you need. Maybe you're, you know, you don't live in a place where anyone's really trying to take anything from you or anything could really get lost or wander off or on. Um, and so, and, and maybe, you know, you don't need such a strong boundary um, because people aren't really, there's nobody around who's really motivated to trespass on your land. So if the people in your life are 
pretty decent. They're not always trying to come on your land. They might do it or come into your, you know, take from your heart. They might do it like maybe sometimes unintentionally, but you'd be able to tell them, right? You'd be able to kind of mitigate. But if you're living in an unsafe environment, your heart is in an unsafe area with a lot of unsafe people around and people who might want to take from you or who might, might not want to take from you but are desperate enough, right? Well, there's a lot of people who are desperate right now. So you might have a high block wall instead of a little fence. Um, you're, you know, you're not as hospitable and the disconnection increases you need more and more and more protection. You could continue to build this wall until it's like, you know, a fortress, a moat, the whole deal, right? And that's where a lot of us are with our heart chakra we've had to like and our heart we've had to like build up this really hard walls um so now think of how when we look at that those boundaries in terms of like you know this analogy of like land and your heart being kind of your property and your land think of how vulnerable and open you would want to be if you didn't have proper boundaries, would you like have a huge party if anyone could wander over? Would you obtain things that make you abundant and place them on your land if you know you didn't have the proper kind of boundaries? Would you, you know, would you be vulnerable enough to be like running around naked near a spot where everyone can see you, right? If you didn't have the right kind of boundaries. And so this, again, I hope helps you see yourself in a higher light in that, you know, you're not vulnerable because you've had to put up these walls, or at least it has felt like it. So I just want to briefly also touch on vulnerability because I think a lot of people think that vulnerability means sharing every piece of yourself, okay? Like you've got to just tell people your deepest, darkest. And it doesn't mean that at all. Um, and in fact, there are people who do share their deepest, darkest or a lot of really personal, intimate things who aren't being vulnerable. And the reason is those deepest, darkest, intimate things are things that they're, for whatever reason, comfortable sharing. Doesn't matter what the reason is. But when we're being vulnerable, we have this tiny, tiny bit of discomfort, this tiny bit of trepidation even, right? And that's sort of what builds that muscle, that helps build that muscle. Just like when you're building a muscle in your body, you're tearing it, right? That tiny little micro tears, which are going to help it build. So ideally, you're sharing something that you haven't shared before. It doesn't have to be big and huge and deep and dark. It just really has to be something new, okay? Um, so now let's look at the practices. And by the way, okay, when we talk about the practices, what makes them work? So doing boundaries and vulnerability, right? Because that's what we're doing. What makes them work is trying them. Opening yourself up in a new way, doesn't have to be huge. Setting, enforcing, and evaluating boundaries. Doesn't matter how people react to it. Doesn't matter if it's really hard for you. Like when I you know, set boundaries with my family, I still feel a tiny bit of guilt sometimes because I've been so habitually guilty for setting boundaries with my family. None of that matters. When you go into the gym and you do a workout, if you hate it, does it still work? Yes. <laughs> if it's hard, does it still work? Yes. Okay. So how people react or how quote unquote hard it is, is not tied to the efficacy in any way. So let go of that. And because of that kind of feature, right, where it's just about trying and not about achieving necessarily anything except, you know, what you've decided on with yourself, this also begins to change the vibrational and psychological correlation between, you know, being attached to an outcome, right? So, that further kind of calibrates into the heart chakra. So um, as far as the very easy practices, we want to do three things, okay? We want to choose wisely. We want to start small. 
And we want to just very reasonably measure outcomes, okay? So when we're choosing, we don't obviously want to choose someone who's been the biggest asshole ever, right? Like that's not the person to start with. Um, maybe that's the person to end with or who knows, maybe we'll never talk to that person again once we get better at sending boundaries, setting boundaries. So what we want to choose in the beginning are surface level relationships. So another way to say this would be shallow relationships. That's okay. And shallow is not always bad. I have shallow relationships with people like professionally that I don't particularly care for as friends but I have to maintain a professional relationship. And so I would say that's a little more surface level. So the idea with this surface level relationships is that, you know, it won't be disastrous if the worst case scenario happens. Like, um, you know, if you chose your boss and you're like suddenly set a boundary because your boss isn't, you know, maybe a very good leader and they don't treat people with respect, that outcome, whether you're right or wrong, your boss, if they're not a very, you know, great leader, they're probably, there's probably going to be some repercussions. But maybe you could start with a colleague who, like I said, you only work with one in a while, okay, once in a while. So surface level relationships where you really don't have that much to lose. And it's okay to start there. It's very natural to start there. When you're running a marathon, you don't like show up one day and run 26 miles. You have to practice. Um, and then the other thing is just to stay away from what I call vulnerability traps. Um, these are the people who will tell you over and over and over that they want to do right by you. And we want to believe that, but they have shown us historically with, with their actions that they can't back it up. Okay, and this, these vulnerability traps, they're so hard because the people who often are telling us that, like, I can do better, or I'm going to be this or that for you, are usually so lacking in self-awareness. Like, they're kind of steeped in their own delusion. And so because they believe it, it's like they sort of pull you into believing it, okay? So stay away from these vulnerability traps. And the clear marker of this is that they have shown you with their actions again and again that they cannot follow through on what we need. We don't need to attach any hatred, emotion, you know, negativity, resentment, none of that. We just need to come to the understanding that, hey, if I look at this from like as data points, they have told me this, you know, or things eight times and eight times they haven't delivered on it. Okay. So um, make a list of people who you could do your practice with, your boundaries and vulnerability practice with. And you're going to do definite yes, maybe, and definite no. And you're just going to keep this list. And we're going to start with definite yeses. And then as you, like, let's say you got through all your definite yeses and you're feeling good about boundaries and vulnerability, then you can move on to your maybes one day. And, you know, you can move on to your definite no's. And, or maybe by then you'll have been like, I know that person's not even around anymore because I just like bugged out because that person was lame. Um, so make this list, keep the list. And you can kind of consider this like, you know, definite yes, beginner, definite, or maybe is kind of like intermediate to advanced. And then definite no, just to be clear, mastery. This is the people that you've been trying over and over and over to set boundaries with, and it's not quite getting there. Um, so yeah, make the list and we're going to start with our, you know, definite yes list and then start small. Okay. We're not, you, it's not very reasonable to think it is possible, but not very reasonable to think that you're just going to suddenly have like blind faith that you can be open with someone or that you can trust someone to have like the least amount of boundaries possible. Okay. You want to set incremental boundaries and be incrementally open. And we're going to measure the results as we go. So we're always going to be constantly evaluating. So small acts of vulnerability look like maybe admitting something, um, you know, in the moment or taking accountability for something. So saying something like, you know, either in the moment or later, I was jealous. You know, I couldn't, if your friend's telling you something, we've had those, I've had those moments where my friend's telling me something great. And it's like, I feel like an asshole because I want to be happy, but I'm like jealous right? And jealousy is coming from, you know, this not being balanced. And so 
Um, just saying like in the moment, like I want to be happy for you, but I'm feeling some jealousy come up or when that's happened before you can go back to that moment and go, Ugh, you know, I really, I'm just not quite there yet. Saying even things like that, like it's something I'm working on, just being really open. It's something I'm working on right now. It doesn't matter what it is, like being open about something you're working on. Um, actually saying to someone, like I'm triggered, or again, if it was in the past, like, you know, I was triggered, I probably, you know, didn't react well, um, or that, you know, I, I got I got, I was angry in that moment. It didn't come out kindly. I recognize that, okay? It's not about the apology. It's just kind of like closing the circle on accountability. Like, and it's not about beating yourself up. Um, it's just about, yeah, I did that. That's part of who I am. It's something I'm working through. And um, this also, again, gives grace for yourself. Like, I'll give you a really good example. I was talking to some, a professional contact and they said to me, you know, looking back, I think I reacted a little defensively to that. And I just remember being so impressed by that, right? Because this was a person who was real. Um, they weren't beating themselves up. They weren't they were just like, like recognizing something in themselves and saying it. And that's a perfect kind of small amount of, you know, vulnerability, accountability. Um, setting small boundaries can be things as simple as not responding to a text right away, Okay. Um, and doing that incrementally longer, let's say. Let's say you always respond to somebody's text immediately, right? Doesn't matter what you're doing, you get in there and you respond. So maybe you, you know, again, be graceful and gentle with yourself. If this is giving you anxiety to even think about not responding to a text, A, you don't have to start there, but B, like, oh, well, could I give myself three minutes, five minutes, and be incremental with that? And this is not about being petty, okay? This is not about teaching you a teaching somebody a lesson like, oh, well, they didn't respond to me and so I'm not responding to them or I'm going to show them they can't treat me that way. It's not about that. It's about you and loving yourself and building your boundary muscle and respecting yourself, okay? And if that means that they think it's petty, because a lot of times when we start setting boundaries, people will just wig out, right? They're like, they feel it, they start getting, their ego starts getting, you know, messed up. Because let me tell you, if somebody's pressing your boundaries over and over, or pressing your boundaries intentionally at all, they have their own issues, okay? So what they think of this doesn't matter. This is about you, and, and if they're, you know, the kind of person that, like, would try to pull you back, they might start telling you, oh, you're being so petty and ridiculous. You're not. You're setting boundaries for yourself. You're, you're learning to love yourself better, okay? And, you're, and in the process, you might be teaching others, but you're also learning to do it for yourself, okay? Um, and so texting, not responding to texts, and doing it incrementally. If you are feeling a certain type of way, right, about something that someone has done, especially someone who doesn't normally, uh, you know, respect your boundaries or want you to have any. And you're not to the point where you can, like, assert yourself and say something like, um, you know, you can't treat me that way or I don't like that or whatever. A good small boundary is to, to sort of, like, dip in that moment and say, you know, I can't talk about this right now. Y you don't, they don't need an explanation, okay, but if, if you're new to this, I know in the past when I would do this, the person would, of course, push back and be like, well, why? And you're, you know, they would, you know, start kind of like gaslighting me and stuff. And it's like, okay, you don't need an explanation. But if you're not feeling, you know, that your muscle is built up enough yet to, to not give an explanation, putting it sort of in terms of you, not them usually we're not doing this for them, right? But this usually gets you off the hook because when they feel triggered that you're saying like you're doing something, so I have to bug, like they are going to push harder. So saying things like, look, I just, I've had a bad day, whatever. This is not, this is, you know, technically not the truth, but if this is what it takes to get you through so that you can start setting boundaries, it's better than doing nothing. So like, look, I've had a day, I, my thoughts are all over, or, you know, this is going in circles, like, I just want to, like, or, you know, we, 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 we do this all the time. We, we get in these, you know, arguments or discussions or whatever, and I'm trying to get a different outcome. Just, you know, let me collect my thoughts, okay? This could be, and, and in that moment, maybe there, you know, you said, 
I want 15 minutes and they called you back in 10 or whatever. Like it's not, not answering, right? Sticking to that. So it can be not going somewhere. You know, we all have those things where we feel like we have to go to family stuff or friend stuff. Don't go. And if you can't quite do that, you can go and say like, well, I have some other stuff that I have going on, or I have to do this or that, or I need rest, whatever. Like go for a little bit. I can show up for an hour. I can show up for two hours. And P.S., if you do that and you know that people are going to give you a hard time when you dip out early, um, you don't have to say goodbye to anybody. If they're not willing to respect the fact that you're saying you can go for an hour and they're going to give you a hard time when you're leaving, I am all for, they look up and they're like, where's, you know, Lori. So, um, and then like just telling somebody like, like if somebody's yelling at you, right? Like I don't, I don't like that. That triggers me in a way that I can't even have a good conversation with you, right? Like being more reasonable. And then the measuring results is really very simple. So it's just, how do I feel, you know, before I say, how do I feel with this person generally? How do I feel right before I set a boundary? How do I feel when I'm enforcing the boundary? How do I feel afterwards if I do it or I don't do it, right? And maybe how do I feel in a couple days or whatever? It's really just because, again, boundaries are for your own health and happiness and, and complete wholeness and wellness. So um, it's perfectly okay to be like, you know, um, it didn't feel right to do that. And I think that boundary is a little strong and I'm going to go back and rework it. Um, and by the way, choosing wisely too can be like, um, somebody that you do have a deep relationship with and you are somewhat comfortable with, but sharing something new with them, like it, to deepen that relationship. It could be somebody that you trust. It doesn't have to be shallow. Um, but choose wisely. Do your definite yes, maybe, and no. Start small, just small little things that you can be you know, open and accountable for. doesn't have to be the deepest, darkest. And then just give yourself some kind of measure based on how you're feeling.